So I'm while we're waiting for the rest of the people to come, I thought I would tell you the story of how I got the job at AUW. And it's a very amazing story. But the reason I'm telling you is because all of this is in your future. Like these things will happen to you. They're not really about me. They're about if you live your life over time and you just keep pursuing something you really care about, uh, there will be terrible things will happen, right? <laughs> but just recently, a whole lot of good things have happened. A lot of things have come together. And I do think at the end of the day, when you, you know, are finally too old to have a lot of choices left, you'll be happy that you took risks and that you really tried every opening, you know, if a door opened, you tried to go in and you just try to live as complete a life as you can. Uh, because again, with Persephone, I told you I had this horrible breakdown. I had just been too much pressure on me for decades, but that's all right. I recovered. <laughs> and um, and my daughter, I think, is okay too. You know, I don't I never wanted my children to have to suffer because I was trying too hard. I had too much to do. Um, but none of that was a choice. It just kept adding up. Anyway, so recently. Um, and, and again, I don't want you to feel sorry for me because you all have much bigger obstacles than I do. And I know that, uh, but about two, two years ago this week or a couple, two, uh, two year, 50 weeks ago, my son was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor on his pancreas. So my son had cancer and, um, of course, <laughs> everybody's scared, uh, pancreatic cancer. The only person I knew that had it was Steve Jobs and he died, right? This horrible, painful, slow death. So anyway, that was a Tuesday I found out and on Saturday, the doctor came and it turns out it wasn't, it was neuroendocrine cancer you didn't need chemo. There was a very specific drug, wouldn't have side effects. And if the cancer hadn't spread to his body, he could just have surgery and he could get rid of it. So that was sort of, wow. Um, so then he did have surgery and he did get rid of it. Um, so I had visited him in the hospital and this, the doctor had said, it's fine. So I had thought I was gonna quit my job. I was gonna go up and help my daughter-in-law raise the two kids. And my son was gonna have a bed in the living room, slowly dying, you know, while the kids are running in and out. That's how I had it pictured, but all of a sudden he was cured. And so I went back to my job and thought, okay, <laughs> Now what? I guess I can just pretend that didn't happen. And um, then two days later, I got an email from AUW headhunter saying, we need somebody to teach one semester a year for a few years. Well, I had planned to teach a few more years, but I had really wanted to do something like mix, you know, teaching at Lyon with teaching abroad because I've taught abroad before. I had just thought I'd have to wait a couple of years, but all of a sudden, and so I contacted this woman on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and she called me on Wednesday and I talked to her. She said, this is gonna work. I'll, I'll contact Nirmila, the vice chancellor. And she talked to me and I talked to my colleague and I talked to my boss and by Friday afternoon, like everything <laughs> was in place and everybody was so happy for me because they kept saying, oh, this is exactly the kind of thing you like. So, um, so it was just a great blessing. It was undeserved. It was just something that came in. Um, and all I wanna tell you is that 
if you just keep trying, right? The reason I got contacted is I had had a Fulbright in Indonesia and I help students in their applications for Fulbright. Um, I read Fulbright applications, but it's not just Fulbright, that all of you have all these other opportunities. And that was actually a number of years ago, but this headhunter had looked that up. So, you know, it's just a, a way to, to encourage you. And um, I know that you're overcoming a lot of obstacles, but definitely it's worth it. And I will be there, you know, with you. And I, I you know, I'll work with you so you can keep going. Um, but anyway, so my boss is Dr. Cohn and she's the age of my youngest daughter. And so she, you know, I think of her like a daughter. And um, she told me she really liked Jungian psychology and she had studied it, which is very rare in the academy. You know that my class is really different. Um, so anyway, she uh, told me a month ago or so, she really likes Hestia. So I just asked her if she would wanna do a little videotape or she has a class at the same time. So she did this and it's 16 minutes long. And I think instead of small groups, we'll just listen to that. And then we'll have our two rounds where everybody brings an example of Hestia and then everybody brings an example of a work of art. Um, Hestia is the least well-known so this one might have been hard. I don't know. I mean, last year there were a lot of the students who identified with Hestia, but that that isn't normal. So if you had trouble finding examples, that's very understandable. And um, so we will carry on. Now, it, this was working before. So let's see if we can get it to work. Professor, we cannot hear. You cannot hear? You can't hear? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sound is not. Ugh. Just a sec. So none of you can hear it? Is that? Okay. Did it, was anybody able to hear it? Yeah, but sound is not clear. That's the thing. It's just muffled? Okay. Um, all right, so you, you can hear it, but you can't understand it? Is that kind of the way it is? Yeah, we can hear the sound, but we, can, we don't understand what's okay. going on, what she says. Okay, so that's, we just won't do it, okay? Um, anyway, you'll, I think you'll like it. And it is nice for you to know who these women are that are guiding you through AUW, you know, they all have their story and we usually, we don't talk about that. And so you just, you can, you can try again. You think, you think I mean, you can try again playing. Let's see how it works again. Well, I'll try it a little louder, but I mean, this is pretty discouraging. Um, and I'll quit after a couple minutes, a minute or two, and then I'll finish the screen share and then ask you once again. And if you, if it was okay, if you heard it okay, raise your hand, otherwise don't, okay? And I can figure it out pretty quickly. Um, Maybe I'll try, no, okay, I'll try this, but I kind of have my doubts. No, same. Oops. Ah. 
Now I can't get it to stop. Just a sec. Okay, so you can't understand it? How many of you cannot understand it? Raise your hand if you cannot understand it. Okay, that's fine. So you'll just have to do it on your own. That's all right. Okay. All right, so now we will just do our usual thing and we'll just go around in the circle about what example could you find of uh, a person, either somebody in your family or somebody in the public eye, which again, is pretty hard to find, uh, that fits with Hestia. So Rook 9, what's your example? Are you there? Okay, Poppy, have you got something? Go ahead. Professor, today I don't have any example because in, um, in my side there is a lot of noises. That's why I don't want to stay today. I want to pass. Okay, um, Claire. Okay, um, my example is another personal connection. It's a friend of mine. I immediately started thinking of her as I read through it. Um, just, I met her when we were young, so I've grown up with her. And now we're both about to graduate college in May. So we've been through a few stages together and she's always been kind of as the chapter says, a little bit just different from everyone else. Um, the way she socializes, the way she thinks like everything is a little bit different, but she's one of the most caring and intelligent people. Her thoughts are deep. <laughs> um, I really liked the part because I had already thought about her and then I got toward the end when it was talking about um, the friendships, which directly connected to us and how we don't talk that often, but we intentionally make time for it. And she's the type that she does intentionally make time for making sure the people in her life know that they're cared for and cared about. So that was my connection. Did you notice that that's the kind of friends that I have too? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you probably, because you've had me before as a teacher, you could probably figure that, right? I definitely saw the connections with you for sure. Okay. So News Rot, did you come up with something? Uh, yeah, Professor. You have to unmute. Yeah, so uh, I can relate just to, to uh, with one of my cousin. Uh, she's the only daughter of her parents. Uh, her family always uh, like treated her as a special one. Uh, when she turned to college, her parents, mostly uh, her father, became really sick. And uh, since then, she started supporting her whole family because there was no one and uh, she didn't even have any brother to support the family and also to take care of them. Uh, like, uh, and only then, like everyone started uh, doing side talk to her parents and to her relatives that why they are not marrying her daughter and uh, why she is doing all the work and all. And uh, she is even passing the age of, age of her marriage and everything. But uh, uh, <clears throat> however, she never gave up uh, um, I mean, she never gave much importance to those side talks because she always thought that if she marries, then there will be no one to take care of her family or to support the family. Uh, she always remained calm uh, in all those situations, believing that she uh, she could do this and uh, whenever she needed to defend herself only, she went and she did. So except that she stayed calm always and uh, she always remained as a virgin lady and uh, she is still supporting her family. 
So <clears throat> I could relate to Hestia, uh, to her, because I found that in Hestia's characteristics, she was also supporting to uh, family and home. And also she remained calm and uh, only just defended herself when it's needed. So yeah, that's why. Good, how old is she now? Uh, now she is 34. Oh yeah, okay. All right. Um, that seems to fit. Uh, Fahima. Professor, I want to pass for now. I'll talk later. Later, okay. Uh, May. Um, okay, I think that I can see some of the Hestia like characteristics in me myself, in the sense that I I am like also independent, introverted, and also um I I don't really need to be surrounded by people kind of like that. I feel that when I'm be when I'm alone, um I can listen to my inner voice more clearly, like talk to myself more softly and understand what I really need more deeply. Because like I feel that when I'm surrounded by people and people have different opinions and point of view and sometimes I may be easily affected by that. So I really need time to be alone to reflect on everything by myself. And also I believe that if I am like attached to um, some of certain people or, or objects, if one day I lose them, I may feel like um, very horrible kind of like that. But when I spend but when I'm independent on myself, I, I feel more fulfilled and happy, kind of like that. And, you know, like some months ago, I also started some of the mindful practices such as like yoga or like meditation because I feel that um, the more chaotic the world outside me is, um, the more I need to focus on my inner world. I need to listen to, my, uh, to what my body, my mind, and also my soul needs rather than just focus on the outside world. So that's what I want to share. <laughs> Good, actually, when you listen to um, Dr. Cohn, she actually is also doing a lot of mindfulness stuff and yoga. So I- oh, Nice. <laughs> you will really like that video. She is a really, really nice person. Um, even if you don't, see, this is a big thing. You don't have to have her personality type, right? Women just should affirm each other exactly as they are for who they are. Um, okay, Lakin, what have you had? What do you have? So, like you were saying, I was struggling to come up with an example. I can see how you fit it. Um, but I can't really think of another person besides myself, really. Um, well, I feel you like I'm very. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, I feel like I'm very introspective and like I pick up on the, the energies and feelings of other people. Like I'm very empathetic. So um, that can be draining a lot of times, but um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, professor, I have a question. Yeah. So I was reading an article, an article about Hestia. So there I found that it's written, Hestia is often skipped over by modern readers. And uh, even in the ancient past, she was removed from Olympus to make room for a demigod. So like, uh, why was she that much ignored? Or like, yeah, <laughs> why was she removed even? Well, actually, you know, it's interesting, Nusrat, because the story in the book is she chose to step down, right? And give her seat to Dionysus. So, you know, was she forced or did she choose it? Um, and, and if you, you know, the people who talk about Hestia, they're very sensitive to other people around them. And so they would choose, right? They choose to go back and stay with themselves, right? To get refreshed. So um, that would be that would be the reason. Does that make sense, Dusrat? Yeah, 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 Professor. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I would say that one of the hardest parts of teaching where I teach is that I am just aware 
that most of the people around me really do not think the way I do. And not only that, they don't like the way I think. And that's that's been the hardest part because I'm self-conscious about it. I don't have ego strength and I talk to other people and they don't even know, they don't think about how other people are thinking or how they're thinking about them. And, but that's, you know, I'm kind of jealous of them. But on the other hand, like my whole job, the way I do my job is that I always ask students, what do you think, right? And I ha want to help them find out who they are and how they think. And I, yeah, that's just the way I am. So when I'm, you know, there's always a few students in every class that really like it. And I always remember them, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot more that don't. So that, that takes a lot of energy out of me. And that's why Hestia would choose, you know, to step down and just wait for people to come to her, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, understood. Okay, so Louis, what have you got? Um, yes, I have an example of my friends. Um, two years ago, her younger brother passed away in an accident. Um, to her, like her brother is not only a family member, but also a companion with her in many traveling around Asia. Um, because like his death came so suddenly and unexpectedly, uh, it's called great sor sorrow for her during a year later. Uh, she was like hopeless, quit the job, did not talk to anyone except from family members and close friends. And most of, most of the time, uh, she spent time alone with herself. Um, and during this time, she practiced meditation, tried to connect to her inner self, um, wrote diary. And then after kind of a year, she's um, kind of recovered and she's able to accept the reality that his brother is gone. She had to continue to live her life, not only for her, but also for his brother. Um, I think my friends, uh, she does not has Hestia archetype naturally, but somehow in the dark time in her life, she found Hestia by choosing solitude to seek the power from inside to go through her pain. Yes, let's see my example. Good, very good. Do you have any idea what she might do in a few years when she starts becoming more herself? Um, yeah, she um, she found she found a um, I I know her that now she found her uh, education center to talk to children um, about her school and psychology uh, psychological psych I'm sorry I lose my brain sometimes like uh, she talked to children about her school and psychology knowledge. Um, yeah, I, uh, for a long time, I haven't contacted her because she, she lived in a northern city, but I know that now she, um, kind of, um, pursue her passion for, for, uh, um, pursue her passion. Like she chose, uh, to work on education film, like at her dream when she, she was a child, I think, yeah. So that's another thing I want you to remember that your friends, you know, I, I have friends I hadn't seen for 15 years or 20 years, but it's always worth it to go back and see, you know, find out how their life has been. You learn a lot about life and about yourself and also about them. So yeah, it's, it's good. Sounds good. We, um, yeah. Yes, Professor. Um, actually, while I was reading the book, I found myself in the archetype of Hestia. Uh, I try to live in the present and focused on what is going on. Uh, and I want to discover myself. So uh, I am in the actually I am in the way of discovering myself. I think it will help me to know my strengths and weaknesses. 
and uh, it will uh, help me to perform my responsibility that I am suitable for. So as you are saying that you are, you try, you always try to um, understand the peoples. Actually it's uh, at the, uh, similarly, I also try it and uh, I like to analyze others' characters to understand and uh, understand the meaning and pattern of life. Actually it helps me a lot. Gradually I feel more confidence it seems I am very close to Hestia. Professor? Professor? Maybe she got disconnected. Professor, can you hear me? I think she I got think disconnected. She, yeah, yeah, I also think like that. Oh, are you there? Professor. Yes. Oh, all right. I thought I'd have to invite you all over again. I, my, my machine broke down, but I, there's no way I thought, okay. Professor. All right. Um, that was a miracle. <laughs> Okay, so we're at Madeline. Madeline's turn. Alrighty, uh, the person that I chose uh, was my best friend Morgan. Uh, she is very, she's, a, she's an introvert. She really keeps to herself, but she's very independent. She doesn't really worry about other people. Um, and she doesn't really get into conflicts. Like uh, she usually listens to what other people have to say rather than her speak out her own opinion. Um, and she doesn't focus on romance at all. Uh, she really just wants to work on getting her college degree. Um, and one like thing that I could really relate to uh, with her was uh, when you were talking about your best friends, how y'all can go out for months without talking, but when y'all talk, y'all like act like y'all never, never lost touch, which is something that ha ha happens when I'm with Morgan. Like we can go without talking for each other for a week or two and then she'll text me or if I'll text her and we'll catch up and we'll talk for hours upon hours just being us. And even though throughout that, she's like the best, she's like my best friend. She doesn't really have a lot of friends because she usually keeps to herself. So um, like she only has a few, few people that she'll really talk to. Good, sounds good. Um, Margia? Are you there? 
Okay, Untari. Oh, Margia, okay, here she goes. She did the chat. Okay, one of her senior uh, schoolmates, her father was an army officer and died when her younger brother was only eight months. Um, they got some help from the army, but society was not good. She started to learn, uh, do extra work for maintaining the family and establish her younger brother. She's still unmarried and works in a bank. She only focuses um, her life, uh, her only focus I think is on her family and providing for them I think is what she is getting at. So good, sounds good. I know that there's just a lot of people in developing countries that have you know, serious issues with people dying and all that. So I know you overcome a lot of obstacles. Um, okay, Huntari. Are you there? Okay, Jareen. So I chose a cousin of mine. She possesses an introverted temperament. She keeps to herself all the time and has social anxiety. She stays away from all kinds of gatherings. Well, sure, her confusion is very confined and she is very calm, mature and intellectual. And she always has a book carried in with her. With her. So she spends her time very productively, mostly studying. And she's very generous and she's very charitable. So I can really just stay with her. Yeah, actually, one th uh, Okay. Oh, Rossi. All right, Rossi. Um, I'll, I'll do that in a minute. Um, I was going to say with Hestia, when people have social anxiety, is that because, I mean, the question is, maybe this introversion isn't natural for them, right? And something's broken and it really isn't gonna be the way they're gonna be if they can get over it. It's an obstacle to them being able to be themselves. Um, I think for a Hestia person, it wouldn't be social anxiety because they like being alone. But um, again, you know her, her better than I do. And um, being aware of how other people think of you could cause that, right? You're too self-conscious. Um, but that's always something I've, I've wondered about is that is social anxiety more for people who aren't naturally that introverted? But that's an open question. It probably changes over time. Um, so Rossi had something in the chat. Let's go read that. Um, the last few years, you, she can relate to Hestia because of trying to find inner peace because of all the uncertainty around you, right? So um, everybody, even if they're not a natural Hestia, they might want to be doing yoga or meditation or something. I know that when I teach Buddhism, and Hinduism in my other class, there are a number of students who hadn't ever thought about meditation, but I make them. That's one of their assignments is they have to sit and meditate for 30 minutes and some of them fall asleep and they don't really think it's gonna be a big deal. But then after 15 minutes or so, they realize that this is really good. I could really use this. You know, and again, with uh, your phones and all the technology around, it really is not good for you to be here, you know, to be constantly responding to texts and constantly punching buttons. It's not good. So I would imagine that a lot of people are turning more toward meditation during COVID to try and get a grip. <laughs> on what's going on, get some perspective. Um, but 
Yeah, it's hard to know. Um, Bondona, do you have something? Yes, Professor. Uh, oh, Professor, uh, like uh, I will link his uh, has here with my like mother's cousin, cousin sister. Like she's not. Uh, She's already 50, uh, age of 50. She is like still uh, unmarried and like uh, she decided uh, not to marry because like uh, because her brother died uh, and the, her wife was left alone and like uh, she had uh, three like uh, uh, three uh, sons and daughters so like uh, my auntie decided not to marry because of the three child and like he const uh, constantly work uh, uh, to earn money for them and to make their life happy like uh, um, and like um, I could uh, relate her with Hesia because like she, uh, she sacrificed her life uh, for the sake uh, of the children uh, like for her brother's children because uh, she could financially uh, support them uh, and give them the happiness and that will, that uh, that her father could give when uh, means if he was alive so like he have completely sacrificed her life and like yes i can compare her with his dear good very good um rupia are you there Um, Fahima, would you like to do it now? Yes, Professor. Okay. Uh, one of my, not only, not my close friend, but she was like, um, yeah, she was the boss at my school. She was working uh, in the library. Uh, she, uh, like, she was up, uh, over over 30 years old but she was like single uh she was studying um her masters and doing her masters in america and she, uh, she was like the only person supporting the family of 10 people in afghanistan and uh, she was the supporter like doing uh, the rule of a father for her family and uh, she was supporting all her sisters and she had uh, uh, sisters a lot of sisters and her mother in Afghanistan though she was dreaming big uh, and uh, and she could establish a library a very standard and a standard library uh, in Kabul, uh, that I was a member of that library, uh, but most of the people was looked looking down to her because she was uh, she was like uh, not following the religious uh, issues, like uh, wearing a scarf or something like that. Uh, she was uh, most of the people pointed out her dressing in America. Okay. That like she is no more Muslim or things like that, and she is still uh, she she uh, she says that she never care about uh, people in Afghanistan. <laughs> the way they say because they don't like her the thoughts of. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sounds that sounds like it matches pretty well. Um, yeah, she's supporting her. That's kind of, yeah. Okay. Good. Let's see, um, Rook9, do you have something to say? All right, I don't know if, okay, so Rook9, you should go into the chat and let me know. Oh, okay, so here's Rupia, all right. Two sisters, they don't have any other siblings. Their dad got paralyzed when they were about 15 and 16. They became helpless. No one was going to help them. That they joined the army and they support their mother. One of the sisters married, but another sister did not marry. And so they're 32 years old and they're twins. Okay. Um, so Rook9 is going to pass today. 
All right, I guess, is there anybody else we haven't gotten for round one um, that would like to talk? I know that Poppy, um, Margia, let's see. I, all right, so let's do the second round. Could you find some artwork? Um, Poppy, oh yeah, you were gonna pass. It's too noisy in the back. Yeah, professor, because today I'm not prepared because uh, in my home there are, there are a lot of relatives in my house, so I am just today on to pass. Thank you. Yep, that's fine. Uh, Claire, you got something? Yes, I had a poem, or it's just a part of a poem I found online. Um, the poem itself was called "The Poem in Honor of the Goddess Hestia." Oh. And I'll just read the part that I um, cut out of it. It said, self-contained, mild, demure, demure, duty bound, you tend the flame, the sacred fire from whence all came. The sacred flame within the soul that moves us, pushes us to be whole as you are whole within yourself. So I just thought that that was really a nice way to honor her archetype. It is kind of amazing when you start looking, it's actually out there. I hope some of you noticed this, that you'd never noticed this before, but now that you're looking for it, you can actually find it. It's actually there. So why don't you raise your hand if you think that that has happened to you? Like it didn't occur to you that you would find all these patterns out there with your friends or your family or people in the public eye. <laughs> okay. Um, it isn't what we normally talk about, right? We normally use Western language, Western psychology um, about personality, personality disorders, or um, it's just the modern discipline of psychology is very different than the ancient one. And the reason I like the ancient one is that it everything is really important and it's sacred and it's valuable. And um, in the modern view, nobody passes judgments on somebody. It's supposed to be objective and detached and it's supposed to be moral relativism because if you are a moral absolutist or you, you, know, you have moral values, you're going to impose them on somebody else. And so that's just been a horrible um, dichotomy. You're either a relativist and everybody has their own, you know, way of life or whatever, or you're this absolutist that everybody has to do it this way. And then in, you know, a lot of religions are very intolerant. So this particular way of looking at archetypes is seeing what's sacred in each one. They're fulfilling a really important need in, that other people have. People have these needs that everybody has to do their, follow their archetype in a way that serves the culture as a whole. You also can go too far. So it is a kind of morality, right? It's a kind of ethic, but it's a very different kind. And so it isn't generally I don't know. I don't think I don't ever hear anybody talking about this, frankly. <laughs> but maybe you'll start, you know, when you're I had to pretty much pull it out of a hat. Um, I had to dig up things or run into things. But um, I'm just handing this to you in hopes you can make some use of it. And you won't be blindsided, you know, as you go into life, you'll be able to spot some stuff and protect yourself from being naive <laughs> or something like that. So, um, so Newsrat, did you come up with a poem or a painting or a, you know? Professor, uh, I searched on the internet about like uh, some poem about Hestia and uh, I found one and the name of the poem was the poem in honor of the goddess Hestia. <laughs> Yeah, Karen Rainbird. So in this poem, 
like uh, all the characteristics of Estia was written and like she's a blessed queen and a virgin, uh, like selfless one, also untouched and pure, self-contained and uh, like her soul is sacred and like all the characteristics of Estia is are written in the poem and uh, like uh, in her life, uh, what she did and why she did and all of her struggle and uh, happiness, wisdom and everything were discussed. So yeah, that's what I found. Okay, the other thing to point out is that even if she's a virgin goddess, she could be married, right? It doesn't mean she's not married. It just means her relationship to her husband is one of independence. Um, for example, one of my, I have a really good friend from high school and she is a psychiatric nurse. Um, so that makes sense, right? She takes care of people with psychological problems, but she uh, did counseling and her husband was one of the people in the counseling groups um, and he was just a thoughtful person. So he also has been HIV positive, okay? So she's been married to him now for over 20 years and he's been having to take these drugs for HIV AIDS and she's never really known, you know, none of them knew, neither of them knew if he's going to get sick and die at any one point in time. Um, and she even told me, you know, if he does die early, I'll go with you, you know, to, to, you know, be, if her husband died, she might consider coming to AUW and teaching, you know, nursing or whatever. I don't know, see if AUW would have offers anything, but I mean, that's the kind of life that she's had. And I never see her husband. <laughs> I think every time I meet with her, even in her house, he would be somewhere else. So it's just not the way they think of each other, right? Um, she's just really on her own. She's very independent without having to be forcefully so, right? It's just natural. And he, he likes that. He's no problem for him. Um, does everybody know that like some couples are really like, we are a couple, you know, and we present to the public as a couple. And then other people like can never even see their spouse, but they're, they're both happily married. They're just really different. Does that make sense to you, Nusrat? Yeah, Professor. Uh, professor, I saw a line here, like it's written, selfless one, untouched and pure. So, I didn't understand it, like untouched and pure. So if someone is untouched, only then the, she's pure. <laughs> I mean, if she's touched, then she would be, <laughs> I mean. I mean, yeah, that, that word purity often gets associated with virginity and all sorts of oppressive attitudes toward women, right? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, like menstruation is pure. That's what everyone believes so. Yeah, so that's why I thought I'd mention that. It's a psychological state. It doesn't have to do with your sex life, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, yeah. It's really important because of course, women really get mistreated. Uh, you know, Aphrodite types get mistreated. They all get mistreated by men in various ways. And that purity, that idea of purity is is often used as a real bludgeon uh usually uh to hurt it hurts women um okay may do you have something um i think of one vietnamese poem which is Yan, like literally translated into english which is which is like um beautiful landscape kind of like that um this poem was written in the middle of like 20th century when my country was in chaotic like economic and also political like um, issues 
and the author was seeing a lot of people like trying to follow you know materialistic value rather than like focus on the spiritual and mental value so he decided to stay away from all of those things um he came back to the countryside and then um lived with nature like he even with the food he ate in um, daily life he he used it from he used the ingredients from his own garden and also like basically he he blended himself with nature to the fullest and he also believed that like the more people like seek money the like it basically like um they will never stop uh, like um just at some point they will just want more and more money kind of like that like so he also believed that like if people don't like spend time like looking from within like what they really need they will never feel happy even even when they have a lot of money in life so that's why even when he doesn't really like have a lot of money or something like that he still like um live a very simple life and he just like keep living like that for the whole life and he could find the, their own his own happiness like without like affecting by a lot of people kind of like that so i feel also connected to um this poem on many level because i feel that before i just like follow what people want me to do and um even when i achieved a lot of things but i didn't really feel happy from within it is only when like i spend time alone like asking myself like simple questions and also look from within that i can really know what make me happy and it's like not really like related to any um people's opinion so that's what i want to share okay good i mean that's why i wanted to teach college because i think somebody with reflective consciousness it doesn't even kick in till high school or so right and then when i went to college I still didn't know that there was actually a discipline until I read Plato's dialogues. And then every week it was, what is holiness? I was like, I asked myself that. What is beauty? I asked myself that. What is justice? And all of a sudden, all these other things that were scattered, you know, all of a sudden there actually is you know, a part of your mind that asks the questions. It's the same part of your mind. So that's what in college, you know, you come to know yourself as having a mind. And that's why, you know, I get a lot of satisfaction out of teaching college, but that's why I teach it mainly as you coming to understand your own mind. Right. And I want yeah. all to be different. Right. It always surprises me when there are a number of women who actually do identify with Hestia because I felt like a Martian from another planet, you know? And so th definitely there's no obligation to do that. But if you do, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there's other people like me. <laughs> so that that's kind of the story is that this particular consciousness is something that can really start to blossom in college um, when you're on your own too. Okay, Lakin. So I found the poem Being Independent by um, Rupi Kaur. Um, and it goes, I do not want to have you to fill the empty parts of me. I want to be full on my own. I want to be so complete I could light a whole city and then I want to have you because the two of us combined could set it on fire. I thought the ending was pretty cute, but it also, you know, stresses uh, self-fulfillment and self-love and how you should love yourself and be comfortable with yourself before getting into a relationship. And yeah, I think that reflects Hestia. Yeah, you remember the three dependent goddesses are, are Hera, Demeter, and Persephone. And those are the ones that are pretty vulnerable, right? But even if they are dependent, it, it's not necessarily bad. They have their own way of being the wife of the CEO, right? 
if they can, you know, play that role, but play it in a way that benefits the culture. And definitely being a mother benefits the culture, but those are the ones that can become unnaturally dependent on their husbands or their husbands can really hurt them um, or men in general. Um, does that make sense to you, Lakin? Yeah, yeah, I get that. Okay, okay Louis. Yeah, I have a, a writing. Um, uh, actually, this is a book called Eternal of Solitude by May Sarden. I think I see her name oh, on, her, on our yes. readings. Yeah, but yes. I, I don't know her as a poem because I know her as an author of this book because I really love this book. Um, um, so my book, like The Solit Eternal of Solitude, was published in 1973. And it's described a year. She spent her life in a small town, quite late, like observing her inner world and the natural world around her. Um, she explored the meaning of solitude and like its role in healing and reflection on many aspects of her life, life, love, relationship, success, failure, uh, like gratitude and the struggle of a creative life. Um, I will read out um, a quote that I really love in this book. Like, I am here alone for the first time in week to take up my real life again at last. That's it, what a strain that friends, even passionate love, um, are not my real life unless they time alone in which to explore and discover what is happening or has happened. Without the interruption, Nurse, nursing and maddening, this lie would become a writ. Uh, yes, I taste it fully only when I am alone here and the house and I resume all conversations. Um, yeah, this is my example. Actually, I think I have that book right over on the shelf. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of May Sarton's books because yeah, she is a classic, right? very introverted um, and, and, you know, Hestia type. So that was a good, there is a poem in the book. So if we have time at the end, I might read it. I have it right here <laughs> glued to, to the wall. Um, okay, Nahida, what have you got? Um, sir, uh, I want to talk about Bibi Russell, who is a fashion designer. And okay. She's from Bangladesh. Actually, she earned her graduation from London College of Fashion. And then she came back to her country. Uh, she has been working with crafts people with a vision to save crafts and revive their dream. When she was asked why she came back to Bangladesh after her graduation, she told people uh, she told that people of Bangladesh needed her as much as she needed them. From her childhood, she used to think Bangladesh as a rich country with colors and music. She wanted to restore their human dignity, restore human dignity. So she is self-confident as well as felt the significance of others' life, life pattern, and respect their actions like Hestia. Is she introverted? Is she um, meditate? Is she pretty quiet and stands in the back and other people do the, the crafts? Or does she go out there and sell, sell the product? No, no, no. She's just uh, looking at the crafts. Uh, she wants to just uh, revive the uh, right. history of Bangladesh. That's why she's doing it. The business is not fact actually for her. She's trying to revive the history of Bangladesh. I see. Okay. Okay. I think she is an extrovert one. I know her. <laughs> well, yeah, she's an extrovert one. There's just different. I mean, she is independent. Yeah. This is where, you know, we've done seven goddesses, right? And so this is where everybody has to balance a lot of them. And this is where also 
um, you could be doing the same thing, but actually, if you're a different goddess, you do a different part of it. For example, with crafts, remember that could be Aphrodite because Aphrodite likes to create that. But if she's not creating crafts, then it could be um, Athena if she's organizing the organization, right? And selling it and pushing to get funding or, you know, expanding it, whatever, that would be Athena. Or if she's Hestia, do you remember Hestia likes photography? I mean, I liked sewing. That was one of my, because it's, um, it's a kind of aesthetic appreciation, but it's for introverts, you know? When you sew, you sit there and you're alone for hours and hours. Um, so um, does that make sense that people will approach the same task in a different way according to their archetype? Does that make sense to you, Nahida? Yes, Professor. Um, that's another thing that's going on in the developing world is this revival of crafts or preservation. That's why I like batik. You know, I buy, I bought this actually in, um, in Indonesia. So I have a lot of clothes that are, you know, native kind of designs and patterns and all that from these different countries that I go to. And the problem is that that also can get exploited. So some of the workers in the textile industries, right, are work under notoriously bad conditions and they're often women. So on the one hand, you have this preservation of crafts or revival, which is really good. But on the other hand, if, um, you know, greed, if it get it can get corrupted by greed. And so it's nice if there's a woman like that, that is sort of at the helm, then, you know, you can make sure that she's gonna make sure the women are working under decent conditions. Does that make sense, Nahida? Uh, uh, Professor, it's, it, uh, I'm not clear if they can corrupt it by greed. <laughs> can you explain it? What? They can corrupt it by greed, you're saying, as you're oh, saying. Oh, well, if not, not, okay, so some woman wants to recover the crafts. Some guy or some person who cares about money or power uh, invests in that project, but then he makes her make the women work 60 hours a week, right, under terrible conditions. And so when she had this original idea to revive crafts, but the people who are funding her to make it possible are forcing the workers into bad uh, situations. So what I'm saying is this woman, I'm sure doesn't do that, but it can happen. Does that make sense to you? But when she's organizing everything by herself, she's confident uh, totally confident, then uh, there can be less less uh, possibility to be corrupted, I think so. Right, that's right. So I agree with that. I'm sure the person you're referring to isn't corrupted, but a good idea can get corrupted by the funder, right? If somebody needs funding, um, that's how it gets kind of abused. Okay, thank you. Okay. I mean, it breaks my heart when I read about this stuff because people have good intentions and then they have to figure out how much they're going to compromise um, in order to achieve a goal that, or, you know, <laughs> it's still good to have women working on these crafts, but under what conditions and how far are you going to go and those are all judgment calls and they're difficult. Um, so Madeline, what have you got? Um, so I chose a poem called Hestia by uh, Melody and I'm gonna read a little bit of it. It says, she was a good and quiet person and she was uh, sweeter than most and she never got into trouble and she was like the type to never boust. She's the goddess of all hearths and she's the goddess of all homes. She always avoided conflict and she took care of those who roam. 
um, it kind of like, even though that she was never very well known and she was very quiet, very introvert, but it's not necessarily a bad thing to be quiet and introvert, to be independent, basically. Okay. Um, Margia. Let's see, Margia, you want to type something in? Oh, did, um, let me see. Uh, she wants to pass. Untari is going to pass. News Rot. Oh, News Rot says, what's the name of the poem, Lakin? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I thought I responded. Rupi, okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've had students bring that poet before. Um, yes, he's very popular. Okay, good. Um, I think I've bought books by her. Did she? What are the names of her books? Yes. Milk and honey is her yes. really. <laughs> yes, that's the one. I think I bought it. Oh, anyway, yeah, I had a student who really loved her. And, you know, what I think I did is buy it and then I gave it to her for a present. Uh, you know, anyway. Okay. Uh, Untari, do you have, you were going to pass today. Okay. Jareen, do you have something? I'm gonna pass. I would like to pass. Okay. Uh, Bondona. Professor, I would like to pass. Okay. Rupia, did you say? Oh. Okay, she had an example of the sisters. Do you have an example of art, Rupia? No problem. Okay. Um, Fahima. Yes, Professor. I've got a poem by... Um, Sasha Timothy, a woman with a book and pen has the power to move nations. A woman with uh, with a mind and voice has power to change worlds. So I really heard, I love the this thing. That's why I want to share it. It has a very good meaning. Um, I wonder if it's okay for the artwork, Professor? Yeah, that's fine. It's hard to hear you because it kind of breaks down. But um, yeah, that was that's fine. Okay, so anybody else who wants to contribute anything? Um, I'll, I'll just talk. I mean, I will use up the hour. I'll, there's other things I can talk about. But if is there anyone who wants to say anything else before I start? Um, how about if you raise your hand? Would you like to also go into small groups? Raise your hand if you would, because students write different things about what they want. Um, all right, so unless the machine is broken, I guess we'll just keep going. This is the this is the book that my student, you know, at AUW um, introduced me to. I think maybe N Nikita Gill, I think a lot of you have heard of her. And she had, um, it says advice from Hestia to girls. <laughs> How's that? You are not made of paper. If you were, you would have turned to ash a long time ago. You are more bone and muscle and beginnings and endings. Evoke that when the world tries to convince you that you are small. You are not, you are not stone. Your heart is warm, but seek no homes in other people's chests. Seek no truths there while your own heart, each throb, 
reminds you of your true home. You are not made of paper. Paper is easy to use and crush, and you were not made for that. You were made flame first, and fire is born knowing its elemental nature. It knows the mystic force in shining alone. How's that? <laughs> Good advice, huh? Indeed. You like it? It's great, sir. <laughs> well, you know, the, yeah. the image of the flame, okay? Hestia tends the flame. And Hermes. And I like it so much. <laughs> okay. Um, so I can type it up, you know, and put it somewhere, send it to you. Um, I might send it in, in the Google Classroom just for fun. Um, but that image of the flame is really important. It's in a lot of religions, um, the inner light. So it's, I think it's just natural. You know, ha have you ever referred to someone as she's really bright, right? It means she's smart, but it means like she lights up like, and that just means, you know, that she's got a lot of energy going. And so um, the notion of eros as a kind of flame, passion, obviously, but just that that would be what drives you to, to seek justice, to seek, you know, it's not primarily about boyfriends, right? It's not primarily about sexual relations. It's about your vision, right? Vision carrier and all this other much, much more profound stuff. Um, all right. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had a student from Vietnam last year, and she said in Vietnam, there's this sort of standard. Um, she played this sort of cartoonish thing that's popular about the woman, the wise woman, and she tends the home and she keeps the home fires burning. And then she goes out and does her job. And then she cooks the food or something. It was really so classic Hestia. I couldn't believe it. Um, but I don't know if the Vietnamese students, do you know about that? The sort of standard idea of? Yeah, I think I, I kind of see uh, those standards in many women around me. I think so. It's very popular. OK, OK. So that, you know, there's that flame of loving somebody, then there's the flame of cooking for them, and then there's whatever. Okay, good. But <laughs> it's also, it's kind of sold as a way for women to serve other people instead of to be their own independent self. And the other thing is being independent is not being selfish, right? Those are really different. Um, because the, the women who are dependent, like Demeter and Hera, they can also be very selfish, right? If a child doesn't honor their mother enough, right? If they try to be independent, then she gets mad. So, so the notion of being selfish or not selfish, that, that's got to go, right? That, that's not the right way to, to cut the pie um women have to just pursue their sense of calling and then they'll have something to offer and that's not either selfish or unselfish it's just a different um way to understand motivation um but when it just gets to be unselfish it's always women who are supposed to be self-sacrificing or whatever so you know you have to avoid somebody trying to guilt trip you, right? Make you feel guilty. Okay, so the readings that I had here, uh, one of them is Jill Kerr Conway. And she, I, the thing that's interesting there is that she does talk about what do we have to do to sustain the inner life against the structures of society it's interesting that she is a very much a Hestia type, but she became the president of Smith College. 
So Smith College is one of the top two women's schools in the country. My sister graduated from Smith College. The other top girls women's college is the one I got my PhD from. Um, but let's see, so, oh yeah. And she also points out the Benedictine rule, the Benedictine rule of work, prayer and meditation. So this is where um, it talks about Hestia likes that kind of uh, life. It doesn't mean she has to literally live in a convent, but I do go live with nuns in the summertime and I enjoy it because they are, those nuns are very independent women and they all have their own personality. And, you know, not very many of them are Hestia, uh, but they, the the prioress, the one in charge, sort of talks to them about their sense of calling and tries to match what she asks them to do with something that would be satisfying to them. So they really do. They function much more on this model of archetypes than almost anywhere else that you'd be. So there was one nun who loved to, um, a weaver, she was, a, she wove scarves and, you know, sweaters. She was a really beautiful weaver. She, lots of her weavings were just works of art that you put on a wall. And so there was the weaver. And then there were two sisters who were potters and they made beautiful pottery. And then there was one who was very much into social justice. And so she would always tell them, you know, we're gonna go demonstrate against the war in Iraq and we're gonna have a bus and reserve the bus and anybody who wants to come. And so I used to go and demonstrate with her against the war in Iraq. Um, and she was very much into, um, well, Pax Christi Peace and Justice Ministry. Then there was, there a number of them were into music, musicians, and because of the, the rituals, they pray four or five times a day. Some of them are assigned to be the organist or the head of the choir. Some of them join the choir. This is their talent. Um, another, another couple more got PhD in history. Um, a couple of them had gotten a PhD in theology. Um, some of them taught K through 12. Some of them taught college. A number of them ran the college. So long ago for hundreds of years, uh, sisters have run these huge institutions uh, when no secular women were ever allowed to have that much power. So they ran big school systems, Catholic schools. They ran big hospital systems, Catholic hospitals, and they ran colleges. So they're very independent. They respect each other for their different talents. Um, so I, I really did. And they also have this rhythm. They pray four times a day, but it doesn't mean they're passive, right? or self-flagellating or anything. Not at all. They just managed to, it helps them not think about stupid things, right? Just stay focused on what matters. Um, so I enjoyed that a lot. Now the second quote, Teresa, the way of perfection, the thing that I noticed here that I don't like, and um, I used to, the, her idea of God is very much a male God. And he's, he's, you know, dominating her. And I don't like, my parents never talked about God that way. But I realized as life started to make be very difficult, I did beat up on myself like that. There was this voice telling me you're not good enough. You have to sacrifice more you have to you know and it was very surprising that I had internalized that powerful male god you know alter ego and it just took me a long time to get rid of it 
And so I do think more in terms of a goddess, but still, I mean, you know, I'm no big, I'm not really that good at it, but I really am offended when I, when I read some of this stuff that didn't used to be offensive to me, but it is now, like, I don't want to touch that stuff. But I did read her book, like, how did I manage to get through that book? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Um, and then Susan Armstrong, the next page, her book, The Spiral Staircase, she started out at age 15 or 16. She joined a monastery. I think she thought she was going to be a, a sister. But the nuns were very cruel and very strict. And they had internalized that male God. And it really messed her up psychologically. She had to get out of there. And um, she also had a whole lot of problems getting a PhD because again, I had that same experience that there's a lot of male fighting, okay? And by male, I don't mean women can do it, but they take their brains and they use them like weapons and they make it into a contest and they disagree with each other and they split hairs, you know, the things that aren't important. So she didn't pass her exams and it was terrible, you know, that was her goal. But it turns out she became an independent scholar and she became much better known. She was a public figure. She was interviewed on public radio. She was pretty much an internationally respected intellectual. So she recovered, but I, I have read a whole lot of what I would call spiritual memoirs by women about, it's just about their search for their idea of the good and then all the obstacles that get in the way. So, you know, if any of you ever want to read some of those things or you want a reference, you, you might easily be able to get them online or you might be able to get them at the AUW library. You might not have to pay for them. Um, but anyway, I, I just immersed myself in those kinds of books for about 15 years. And it really helped me get oriented toward the world um, and not feel like other people are coming at me and I can't find anything I identify with out there in the world. Um, then Andrea Dworkin, um, she, I don't know if you have this stuff in front of you or if you remember, but she wrote uh, books on letters from a war zone about pornography. That was in the previous chapter. And it really is horrible, the stuff that she, uh, <laughs> that she talked about and what a big industry it is and how many men really get off uh, sexually on watching women get whipped or, you know, harmed. And, um, but she herself was trying to pass statutes in cities that would uh, make pornography illegal because the argument was it's creating this terrible climate where women are a lot more vulnerable just because the climate of pornography. And um, there was a lot of pushback by other women who say, you're assuming women aren't capable of making their own free choice and it's a free country. Anyway, you have women dissing women, unfortunately, but a lot of people really picked on her a lot. She was not glamorous looking and people mocked her and demonized her. She really got victimized by her exposure of the really dark side of men, men's sexual fantasy life. I don't know if how many of you are aware of that kind of literature, but when she started doing it, there was nothing. She started a whole, again, she 
a whole cultural space, right? That was just completely invisible and silence. And she blew it open. She exposed it. And now there are, you know, quite a few things written about it. But boy, she got in trouble for that. Um, then Virginia Woolf is just an older one. And um, I, I don't know a lot about Virginia Woolf, but um, Shakespeare had a sister. Um, actually, Albert Einstein's wife, his first wife was a physicist. And nobody really knows how much she helped him develop his theories. Uh, they ended up having kids right away and she just took care of the kids. But there's lots and lots of examples, right? Of the wife who sort of takes second place um, and nobody really knows how much of his inspiration came from her. Uh, there was a movie out recently called The Wife. Um, have any of you seen that movie? She was, she married her literature professor and he ended up getting a Nobel prize, but actually she wrote the books, but she, he was, oh, he was so disgusting. <laughs> I mean, it was a good movie. He was a really disgusting, full of himself person. And uh, her son really could see that and just didn't understand why she put up with it. And then right toward the end, it was all exposed that actually this was her work. Um, but that I, I was on the airplane. I don't watch a lot of movies, but when I'm on airplanes, then I just have a little marathon, you know, because it helps you forget <laughs> about time passing. So that was a good movie. Um, yeah, then I had Now I Become Myself. Uh, Adrian Rich, really, when I started reading these, these works, um, I just realized when you're trying to find, to dig out something from nothing, right? Um, uh, digging up from the wreck, right? Just knowing that the culture, everything is messed up. So how do I find a voice? How do I voice this? and you know, let people know. So it really, to me, it took me a long time to realize the kind of psychological effort that would take. Um, it's kind of like when you watch a professional in like in the Olympics, right? You watch them, it doesn't look like it's that hard. They make it look really easy, <laughs> but it's not, right? So when you read these poems and you read some of these essays, you might just be reading it like, oh, that's interesting. But wow, the kind of psychological work that it took for them to actually dig out what was there but had been totally silenced is uh, really amazing. So um, one thing you can do, right, is just appreciate that women have done this stuff and your life's going to be easier for it. But then you in turn pass on, you figure out what cultural space do I want to make? Um, and this, you know, Hestia is the, the one who writes the essays or the one who writes a you know, book like I wrote. Um, but other people write lots of things that women are doing these days. That's really great. Um, then there was Simone de Beauvoir. Nobody would have imagined that her father treated her like that, right? Unless she wrote about it. It was shocking, right? Because she was so accomplished by the end of her life. But it was a, it was a very difficult journey for her. Um, OK. Professor Gannon, take the chat box, please. Can you what? Chat box. Can you please check the chat box? Oh, chat box? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you say, what's the meaning of her virginity? Um, 
Yeah, it's not about sex at all. It's psychological, right? So the thing about consensual sex, that, that's where you get, those are issues of power. They're issues of a lot of other stuff, but that's out there in the public, right? Um, virginity is not about sexual life. <laughs> it's about how, how independently you think. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. So and what it actually, how do you know you're expressing Hestia? I think actually if, if you have to ask that question, probably that's not your type, right? It just doesn't occur to you. But what these readings, you know, are trying to show you is that some women go through life, they, they just feel like there's nobody out there like me. And then they go back into themselves and sort of write something that they've never seen. Now, the thing about consensual sex is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. That would be Athena that would be concerned about, we have to have a legal system that distinguishes between rape and consent, right? And we have to make sure and catch the people, the guys. They shouldn't be able to get away with it. And does that make sense? That's more of an Athena orientation. Um, does that make sense to you, Margia? Yes, Professor. Okay. Um, then there's things like uh, women who just want to be assertive and they don't want they want to have consensual sex just because the kind of personality they have, right? I want to live my life um, and I don't want to have to worry about what other people think. Uh, but that, that wouldn't be a Hestia so much. That would be somebody like Artemis that her life is lived out there. She's assertive and aggressive and she wants a full life. Um, but even then she's pretty independent, right? She'll have sex, but she won't get married or she'll get married, but she has her whole life apart from her husband. She doesn't depend on her husband for her identity. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I wanted to bring up. Um, uh, Professor, can you please talk about that assignment you posted? Yeah, okay, so that was, that was the last thing. Uh, so there is an, a, a paper due. Um, it's not due for 10 days or so. And it's going to be, so I posted the description of it. I posted the paper grade worksheet and I will talk to you about it in class next time after we've talked about the chapter. You can always come to me during office hours. It's just, you have to come up with a thesis about how do all these goddesses together, how do I think about them? How do I, um, how do I anticipate, how have I combined them in my life so far? And how do I anticipate balancing them out or combining them in the future, right? So that's the overall topic. Now, a thesis statement, one of the students, and I will post some of the papers from the students last year. A thesis statement would be, I had a student, she said, I'm basically a Hestia, but I want to start an environmental uh, protection organization, NGO, eventually. So I'm going to have to kick in Artemis. I'm going to have to be a lot more assertive than I naturally would be. And I'm going to have to be a lot more of Athena managerial than I would naturally be. Um, and that's what I've had to do that, right? Someone, one of the other people I was reading said that, you know, she in order, oh, actually Dr. Cohn, 
Dr. Cohn said that exact thing. So when you look at the tape, that's what she'll say. She said, okay, in order to get the degree, it's so funny how she said this. I knew I was gonna need more Artemis and more Athena. So, so um, she also said that when she read the section on uh, Hestia, she kept nodding and she could identify with that. So next time you read the conclusion, we do all the same things. It's a conversation between all the goddesses and Sophia. And um, then toward the end of that class, we will talk about the papers, but you need to have read it and thought about it. And you can always meet with me in office hours, right? Because I get these anxious questions. And, um, you know, each student, I'm going to have to talk to separately if there's an anxiety problem. Plus, you might want to start your paper and then come to me for office hours, right? Oftentimes that works better. You have some kind of a thesis or some idea of, um, so Lakin also read the spiral sta staircase, that's nice. So you have some idea of where you wanna go with it and then we can talk about it. But, um, so the last 10 minutes next time, and then you do, you are required to meet with me individually in a conference to talk it through. So that's where we're going. It's 940 now. So I'm gonna let you go and I will be around. Let me see, there's a big conference this week. So I am gonna be busy until 10 o'clock or 1030 tomorrow. And actually I've got meetings until 10 p.m. on Wednesday and Thursday, which is 10 a.m. your time, right? But I I can be after that, you know, 10.30 to 11.30 or something, uh, I can be around. But you should probably email me if you want to meet with me um, the next couple nights. Otherwise, uh, I should be online. And I have forgotten to do that lately but you can always email me and um, remind me, just say, I would like a conference. So an office hours. So go ahead. I mean, I do have time. I just have been forgetting because nobody comes, but they will start now. So. Okay, you can say what you want, but go ahead. Everybody else should go. If you have a question, then I'll be here. Oh, that was bright. Okay, so Fahima and Jareen, you have questions? Okay. So, Jereen, do you have a question? So Fahima or Jareen, do you have questions?
oh, I have to stop. Stop the recording.